Laura by Saki No one knows why Hector Hugh Monroe called himself Saki, the name of the cupbearer in Fitzgerald's Rubaiyat. Saki was born in Burma, went to school in England, traveled through Europe, and was killed a sergeant in the Royal Fusiliers at Beaumont Hamel in 1916, at the age of 46. William Drake, in Memories of the War, says that the soldiers of the First World War read Saki in the trenches, attracted perhaps by his upper-class schoolboy tone, carried to the extreme of talent. Saki was one of the funniest, most caustic of British short story writers. He was also the author of many famous one-liners, such as, The cook was a good cook, as cooks go, and as cooks go, she went. Waldo is one of those people who would be enormously improved by death. Never be a pioneer. It's the early Christian that gets the fattest lion. You are not really dying, are you? asked Amanda. I have the doctor's permission to live till Tuesday, said Laura. But today is Saturday. This is serious, gasped Amanda. I don't know about it being serious. It's certainly Saturday, said Laura. Death is always serious, said Amanda. I never said I was going to die. I am presumably going to leave off being Laura, but I shall go on being something. An animal of some kind, I suppose. You see, when one hasn't been very good in the life one has just lived, one reincarnates in some lower organism. And I haven't been very good when one comes to think of it. I've been petty and mean and vindictive, and all that sort of thing when circumstances have seemed to warrant it. "'Circumstances never warrant that sort of thing,' said Amanda hastily. "'If you don't mind my saying so,' observed Laura, "'Egbert is a circumstance that would warrant any amount of that sort of thing. "'You're married to him, that's different. "'You've sworn to love, honour, and endure him. I haven't. "'I don't see what's wrong with Egbert,' protested Amanda. "'Oh, I dare say the wrongness has been on my part,' admitted Laura dispassionately. "'He has merely been the extenuating circumstance.' He made a thin, peevish kind of fuss, for instance, when I took the collie puppies from the farm out for a run the other day. They chased his young broods of speckled Sussex and drove two sitting hens off their nests, besides running all over the flower beds. You know how devoted he is to his poultry and garden. Anyhow, he needn't have gone on about it for the entire evening, and then have said, let's say no more about it, just when I was beginning to enjoy the discussion. That's where one of my petty, vindictive revenges came in, added Laura with an unrepentant chuckle. I turned the entire family of speckled Sussex into a seedling shed the day after the puppy episode. How could you? exclaimed Amanda. It came quite easy, said Laura. Two of the hens pretended to be laying at the time, but I was firm. And we thought it was an accident. You see, resumed Laura, I really have some grounds for supposing that my next incarnation will be in a lower organism. I should be an animal of some kind. On the other hand, I haven't been a bad sort in my way, so I think I may count on being a nice animal. Something elegant and lively with a love of fun. An otter, perhaps. I can't imagine you as an otter, said Amanda. Well, I don't suppose you can imagine me as an angel if it comes to that, said Laura. Amanda was silent. She couldn't. Personally, I think an otter life would be rather enjoyable, continued Laura. Salmon to eat all the year round, and the satisfaction of being able to fetch the trout in their own homes without having to wait for hours till they condescend to rise to the fly you've been dangling before them, and an elegant, svelte figure. Think of the otter hounds, interposed Amanda. How dreadful to be hunted and harried and finally worried to death. How the fun with half the neighborhood looking on, and anyhow not worse than this Saturday to Tuesday business of dying by inches. And then I should go on into something else. If I had been a moderately good otter, I suppose I should get back into human shape of some sort. Probably something rather primitive. A little brown, unclothed, Nubian boy, I should think. I wish you would be serious, sighed Amanda. You really ought to be if you're only going to live till Tuesday. As a matter of fact, Laura died on Monday. So dreadfully upsetting, Amanda complained to her uncle-in-law, Sir Lulworth Quain. I've asked quite a lot of people down for golf and fishing, and the rhododendrons are just looking their best. Laura always was inconsiderate, said Sir Lulworthy. She was born during Goodwood Week, with an ambassador staying in the house who hated babies. She had the maddest kind of ideas, said Amanda. Do you know if there was any insanity in her family? Insanity? No, I never heard of any. 
The father lives in West Kensington, but I believe he's sane on all other subjects. She had an idea that she was going to be reincarnated as an otter, said Amanda. One meets with those ideas of reincarnation so frequently, even in the West, said Sir Lulworth, that one can hardly set them down as being mad. And Laura was such an unaccountable person in this life that I should not like to lay down definite rules as to what she might be doing in an after state. You think she really might have passed into some animal form? asked Amanda. She was one of those who shaped their opinions rather readily from the standpoint of those around them. Just then Egbert entered the breakfast room, wearing an air of bereavement that Laura's demise would have been insufficient in itself to account for. Four of my speckled Sussex have been killed, he exclaimed, the very four that were to go to the show on Friday. One of them was dragged away and eaten right in the middle of that new carnation bed that I've been to such trouble and expense over. My best flower bed and my best fowl were singled out for destruction. It almost seems as if the brute that did the deed had special knowledge how to be as devastating as possible in a short space of time. Was it a fox, do you think? asked Amanda. Sounds more like a polecat, said Sir Lulworth. No, said Egbert. There were marks of webbed feet all over the place, and we followed the tracks down to the stream at the bottom of the garden. Evidently an otter. Amanda looked quickly and furtively across at Sir Lulworth. Egbert was too agitated to eat any breakfast and went out to superintend the strengthening of the poultry yard defences. I think she might at least have waited till the funeral was over, said Amanda in a scandalised voice. It's her own funeral, you know, said Sir Lulworth. It's a nice point in etiquette how far one ought to show respect to one's own mortal remains. Disregard for mortuary convention was carried to further lengths next day. During the absence of the family at the funeral ceremony, the remaining survivors of the speckled Sussex were massacred. The marauders' line of retreat seemed to have embraced most of the flower beds on the lawn, but the strawberry beds in the lower garden had also suffered. I should get the otter hounds to come here at the earliest possible moment, said Egbert savagely. On no account! You can't dream of such a thing, exclaimed Amanda. I mean, it wouldn't do so soon after a funeral in the house. It's a case of necessity, said Egbert. Once an otter takes to that sort of thing, it won't stop. Perhaps it will go elsewhere, now that there are no more fowls left, suggested Amanda. One would think you wanted to shield the beast, said Egbert. There's been so little water in the stream lately, objected Amanda. It seems hardly sporting to hunt an animal when it has so little chance of taking refuge anywhere. Good gracious, fumed Egbert. I'm not thinking about sport. I ought to have the animal killed as soon as possible. Even Amanda's opposition weakened when, during church time on the following Sunday, the otter made its way into the house, raided half a salmon from the larder, and worried it into scaly fragments on the Persian rug in Egbert's studio. We shall have it hiding under our beds and biting pieces out of our feet before long, said Egbert. And from what Amanda knew of this particular otter, she felt that the possibility was not a remote one. On the evening preceding the day fixed for the hunt, Amanda spent a solitary hour walking by the banks of the stream, making what she imagined to be hound noises. It was charitably supposed by those who overheard her performance that she was practicing for farmyard imitations at the forthcoming village entertainment. It was her friend and neighbor, Aurora Burrett, who brought her news of the day's sport. Pity you weren't out. We had quite a good day. We found it at once, in the pool just below your garden. Did you... Kill? asked Amanda. Rather. A fine she-otter. Your husband got rather badly bitten in trying to tail it. Poor beast, I felt quite sorry for it. It had such a human look in its eyes when it was killed. You call me silly, but do you know who the look reminded me of? My dear woman, what is the matter? When Amanda had recovered to a certain extent from her attack of nervous prostration, Egbert took her to the Nile Valley to recuperate. Change of scene speedily brought about the desired recovery of health and mental balance. The escapades of an adventurous otter in search of a variation of diet were viewed in their proper light. Amanda's normally placid temperament reasserted itself. Even a hurricane of shouted curses coming from her husband's dressing room in her husband's voice, but hardly in his usual vocabulary, failed to disturb her serenity as she made a leisurely toilet one evening in a Cairo hotel. "'What is the matter? What has happened?' she asked in amused curiosity. 
The little beast has thrown all my clean shirts into the bath. Wait till I catch you, you little... What little beast? asked Amanda, suppressing a desire to laugh. Egbert's language was so hopelessly inadequate to express his outraged feelings. A little beast of a naked brown Nubian boy, sputtered Egbert. And now Amanda is seriously ill.